Okay, so I'd like to thank Patrick and Steve for inviting me today. It's lovely to be here. So I'm not talking about all the muscular dystrophies because there are a number of muscular dystrophies. I'm just going to concentrate on Duchenne, so I hope that's all right with everybody. <laughs> so if I just introduce what Duchenne muscular dystrophy is. So it's um, a muscle wasting disease. It's the most common of the muscle wasting diseases. Um, it affects one in three, three and a half thousand boys, so it's X-linked, uh, only affecting boys. Um, and it's caused by mutations in the dystrophin gene, which result in no dystrophin protein being present in skeletal and cardiac muscle. Now, dystrophin normally serves very important uh, functions in muscle. So its main function is a structural role. So it holds together the cytoskeleton um, and makes a link with the extracellular matrix through this association of a dystrophin-associated protein complex at the sarcolemma. So when it's not there, the muscle fibres break down. Uh, the sarcolemma loses its integrity and there's an influx of calcium and as a result the muscle fibre undergoes necrosis and the muscle fibre wastes away. <clears throat> so the muscle fibres, which this is a normal section through a muscle, so the dystrophin is stained around the outside of the sarcolemma and this is um, a biopsy from a patient and you can see there's no dystrophin and the muscle fibres have wasted away and they've been replaced with fibrotic and inflammatory tissue. Now it's progressive in nature, so boys are normally diagnosed around the ages of two to three when parents will notice they have trouble climbing stairs and getting up off the floor to a standing position. They eventually end up uh, wheelchair bound around the ages of 12 and then require respiratory intervention around the age of 20 and then patients eventually die in their early 30s from respiratory and cardiac failure. So it's an absolutely devastating disease. And as yet, there are no genetic cures for DMD, but there are a number of areas of work ongoing in a number of labs. As Patrick says, in Royal Holloway, we don't just concentrate on gene editing, we're also doing other things. So just to quickly go through what they are. So we're using antisense oligonucleotides to uh, correct the reading frame of the RNA. So the mutations in the dystrophin gene that cause Duchenne disrupt the reading frame of the transcript. So with antisense oligos, we're trying to block uh, splice enhanced motifs on an outer frame exon that neighbours a mutation. And in doing so, we can restore the reading frame of the transcript. And we'll get expression of a truncated but functional dystrophin protein. Now these antisense oligos are in clinical trial. And very excitingly, in the last month or so, um, the first antisense oligo has received conditional approval for use in the states for Duchenne. So it's really exciting. But the problem with antisense oligonucleotides is that it's uh, a treatment that needs repeat administration. So it's a weekly injection. So it's going to be really expensive and might actually be cost prohibitive. Um, and also the antisense oligos are mutation specific. So it's not that one antisense will treat all patients. So the one that's just been approved will treat 13% of patients, but there's a whole large number that need to be optimised and put through clinical trial. So it's not the be-all and end-all. So we're also working at Royal Holloway on gene addition therapy, and this would be a universal therapy. So we're using adeno-associated viral vectors to deliver a working copy of the gene. Now the trouble with dystrophin is it's the biggest gene in the body. So it's over 14 KB of coding sequence, and it's far too large to package into an AAB vector. So we've designed these so-called microdystrophins, which contain virtually all of, will encode virtually all of the functional motifs that will give dystrophin its function. And these AAV vectors, encoding the microdystrophin, have gone through small animal um, uh, preclinically and now large animals, and the results look so good that clinical trials are now being planned for next year which is really exciting again. Um, but with AAV vectors, there is the risk of um, an immu immune response against the capsid protein. So it may not be able to treat all patients. And there is the potential that you'd have to go back in after five years or so with another dose. So we're also working at Royal Holloway, um, trying to um, upregulate muscle growth because obviously uh, Duchenne is a muscle wasting disease. So we need to make the muscles bigger and stronger. So we're doing this by inhibiting myostatin, which is a negative regulator of muscle mass. So if we can knock out myostatin, then we can allow the muscles to grow bigger and stronger. 
And we're doing that with um, antibodies to block myostatin action. And we're also using antisense oligos to disrupt the reading frame so that no, uh, no myostatin is produced. Um, and again, this would be a weekly treatment, so it isn't the be-all and end-all. And the last area of work, which is why I'm here and you're here, is the genome surgery. So obviously this has major, major advantages because we're targeting the DNA, so it could be a permanent one-off treatment. And if we target the right sequence, it could provide a universal gene editing strategy, so be applicable to all patients. Oh, sorry. All right, so the, this slide summarises the target sites of the endonucleases we've designed. I won't go through all of them, <clears throat> but I will talk about um, this one first. So this is targeting intron 44, the dystrophin gene. So uh, there is a mutation hotspot um, from the Duchenne, uh, which is concentrated in exons 44 to 45. So 65% of patients have mutations in this region. So by targeting five prime of this, we could try and develop a therapy that's applicable to 65% of patients. So I'll tell you about the work we're doing there. And I'll also talk about the work we're doing in an animal model of the disease. Uh, and this will allow translational development. Uh, so I'll explain more about this in a minute, but it's targeting an intron exon boundary. And then the final area of work I'll talk about is targeting a safe harbor site, um, which has been made possible through collaboration with Claudio Massolino. Um, uh, so it's the AAVS1 safe harbor site, which is on chromosome 19. So it's so-called AAVS1 because AAV vectors um, efficiently integrate into this uh, location. They integrate safely and efficiently and are expressed um, well and safely. So that's what we'll talk about. So the first area is the intron 44. So this work is maybe a little bit dated, and that's why we used meganucleases. So um, it was at the beginning of the evolution of the endonucleases. So as I said, we targeted intron 44, which is 5' prime of a mutation hotspot. In the lab, through collaboration with uh, Vincent Mooley at the Institute of Myology, we have a patient cell line that has a deletion of exons 45 to 52, so it's a patient cell line. So if we cut in intron 44, and then supply a targeting repair template that's carrying the missing exons, the hope is that we'll be able to knock in uh, those exons and completely repair the gene. So the first step was to show that the meganuclease is expressed. So that we collaborated with selectors on the design and they supplied it. So it's a bisystronic construct with a GFP um, driven by an SFFV promoter and then a meganuclease driven by a CMV promoter. So we looked for um, GFP expression using fax analysis. I should say that the, this was packaged into integrating competent and integrating deficient lentiviral vectors for delivery into cells. So this is 293 T cells, and we looked for, for GFP expression. You can see that over 90% of cells at two different uh, doses, MOIs, uh, were showing expression of the GFP. When we harvested uh, protein and formed a western blot for the meganuclease, you can see that there's a clear difference between the levels of expression seen with the um, integrating deficient lentiviral vectors compared to the integrating competent, and there is a clear dose response. So we, we chose to then concentrate on using an MOI of one and an ICLV delivery rather than IDLV. So we then um, had a look to see if the, the meganucleases were cutting. So to do this, we infected patient cells with the ICLV meganuclease, harvested the DNA, and then performed PCR around the target site. Uh, the amplicons were then next generation sequenced, and we looked for evidence of cutting by looking for small insertions and deletions, so it would be non-homologous end joining repair of the double strand break. And you can see that with the higher MOI, we're getting up to 10% evidence of double strand break, which we considered was good enough to carry on to look for homology directed repair of the break. So for this, we designed a repair template carrying the missing exons, so exons 45 to 52, which at the time the super exon terminology wasn't around, but it would be a super exon. Um, and it was flanked by synthetic splice acceptor and splice donor. 
and a splice enhancer element. We use 1.5 KB arms of homology. So they're big arms of homology, but that was to get integration of quite a large construct rather than a, trying to correct point mutation. Um, so this was packaged into an integrating deficient lentiviral vector and was co-transfected with the meganuclease into the patient cell. And we were able to show at the DNA level that we are getting um, integration of our repair template. So for this, we harvested the DNA and then performed nested PCR around the knock-in. So we used primers that were outside of the arm of homology into the cDNA knock-in on both sides. And we produce a band of the correct size that was only evident when the meganuclease and the repair template are used together, but obviously weren't there when the meganuclease or the repair template were used separately. So we took this as um, encouraging. But obviously we want to know that this super exon is uh, correctly spliced to the neighbouring exons, so exons 44 and 53. So for this, we harvested RNA and performed nested RT-PCR using, again, exons outside of the um, exon, exonic knock-in and into this, uh, the knock-in. And you can see that we are producing the correct bands that match that seen in wild type cells that obviously isn't present in non-treated um, cells. So in effect, we are producing full gene cre uh, correction, which is really exciting. And in fact, we're the only group that have ever shown correction, full correction of the dystrophin gene. Others have shown big deletions, but not full correction. So this is really good. Um, but unfortunately, we were unable to show dystrophin protein expression. And we suspect that that's because uh, the meganuclease maybe isn't the most efficient. And also, we're relying on HDR for repair, which obviously won't be um, optimal in uh, my blasts. So we've now optimized um, an, a guide RNA to intron 44 to try and develop CRISPR-Cas9 editing and look to see if we can do, uh, get HDR working um, at a higher level. We're also looking, as Patrick hinted, there is now this uh, new uh, technique where you can look to develop homology independent repair using non-homologous end joining knock-in, which obviously would hopefully work much better in our, our cells. And we want to extend the repair template, and we're going to use Gibson cloning to extend the repair template from exons 45 to 79 to the end of the gene. Uh, so that we can have a repair strategy that's applicable to more than 65% of patients. So that's ongoing. So if I, so it's lots of little projects, I apologise for that, but it's a very complicated disease with lots of mutations. So if I go into the work we're doing on the mouse MDX gene, so this is the dystrophin gene in the mouse. So this is, a, the MDX mouse is a widely used uh, mouse in uh, DMD studies. So it contains a stop mutation, which you can't see because it's red against red, which is stupid. But it's a nonsense stop mutation in exon 23. So we've designed a pair of talons targeting the intron 22, exon 23 boundary. And the theory is that non-homologous end joining, so the cleavage site is shown there in yellow, the, the T, which is very close to the splice site. So non-homologous end joining repair would hopefully could have the potential to, to silence this splice acceptor site. So that exon 23 would no longer be um, spliced to exon 22 and would get a permanent exon 23 skip in effect. So exon 23, I should say, is in frame. So skipping exon 22 will still um, maintain the reading frame of the transcript. So we should get truncated but functional dystrophin protein expressed. And the second strategy would rely on homology directed repair using this large repair template, which contains wild type um, exon 23 and has again large arms of homology for knock in. So we started work in vitro in the MDX cells, so these are called H2KB MDX cells, and we used um, messenger RNA uh, encoding the talons, nuclear affected into the cells. And we show that the talons are expressed, so the messenger RNA delivery is working. And then when we harvest RNA and perform nested RT-PCR, so we're using primers to exon 21 to 24, you can see this is the full length band, um, but in, when right and left talons are used together, there is evidence that we are getting exon 23 exclusion, which is really exciting. Um, obviously, when left and right talons are used alone, um, there is no, no such 
Exxon 23 skip. So we've gone on to perform some preliminary in vivo studies in the MDX mouse. So we used Talon messenger RNA as a pair, um, also packaged into AAV vectors, and then together with the repair template in an AAV vector. And so it was a single intramuscular injection. We harvested muscles two weeks later and then looked for dystrophin protein expression. So this is the saline injected control, and you can see there are some dystrophin positive fibers. These are called revertent fibers, and they're characteristic of the MDX mouse. Um, so they're, they're there because there is an intrinsic exon 23 skipping, so skipping over the, the stop mutation. They're just a characteristic, and there's nothing you can do about them. You just have to take them away from any study you're doing. But you can see with right and left talons on their own, either delivered as an AAV vector or as messenger RNA, there is the hint that there are clusters of dystrophin positive fibers which might um, coincide with the site of injection. But unfortunately, there was no significant increase in the number of dystrophin positive fibers um, in these two cases. But when a repair template was used together with the uh, right and left talon um, as AAV vectors, there was a significant increase in the number of dystrophin positive fibers which perhaps goes against logic, because obviously we're relying on homology-directed repair, um, but uh, we are encouraged by this, and we are now repeating the study with higher doses, because at the time we went in with very, very low doses of the AAVs. Uh, there was a problem with the expression, but we now have much higher doses, and just two weeks ago, um, more mice were injected with the right and left talon and the repair template, and we should have a result just after Christmas, which will be good to see. Um, but as part of that study, we're going to extend it to include electrophysiology. So we're going to use isolated muscles to look at the contraction relaxation process, which is obviously affected in the MDX mouse, to see if we're improving muscle function with the dystrophin expression. And again, we've also optimised guides uh, for this region. And we do have a project where we're using um, oligonucleotides to repair the point mutation. Um, but that's still in its early phases. Um, and again, we will try and adapt the repair template so that we can use homology independent knock-in to see if it's more efficient. So for now, I'll move on to the universal gene editing strategies, because obviously that's the ultimate goal, to have one strategy that's applicable to all patients. So we have two projects um, trying to achieve this. One of them would be considered near universal. So for this, we're targeting the five prime end of the dystrophin gene. So um, we would then aim to knock in a microdystrophin. So it would be, it's sequence optimized to have enhanced levels of expression. And by knocking in at this end of the dystrophin gene, we'll bring the, its expression under the control of endogenous promoters, which would mean it's only expressed when required, and it's also expressed in the right location in the skeletal and cardiac muscle. So I won't talk about that, but I will talk about the universal gene editing strategy where we're targeting the AAVS1 safe harbor site. And again, it's the same concept to try and knock in a sequence optimized microdystrophin. So as I said, this has only been made possible uh, through collaboration with Claudio Mussolino, who we're really grateful to. So he supplied us with a pair of talons targeting the AAVS1 site. And we've also designed guides targeting the same region. And we've tested them in HEC 293T cells to look for um, double strand breaks. So it's just um, talons on their own without a repair template or guides on their own. And you can see using the T7E1 assay that we're getting around 10% uh, evidence of gene cleavage, uh, which is good. And this is the repair template that Claudio supplied. So it has right and left arms of homology has a puramycin resistant cassette to allow positive selection, and that's under the control of the endogenous promoter, which is a protein phosphatase regula regulatory subunit. And it also has a GFP, so we can track um, integration, and that's under the control of a PGK promoter. So we've done some, stud some preliminary studies. I have to say this project's only been going about four months, so. It is uh, new data, and, um, but we're excited how quickly things are moving. So he we've transfected HEC293T cells with either the talons or the CRISPR-Cas9 guides with the repair template. 
and we perform nested PCR, again using primers outside the arm of homology, and on the left-hand side into the puramycin resistance cassette, and on the right-hand side outside the arm of homology into the GFP. And you can see that with both the Talons and the CRISPR-Cas9s, we're getting evidence of genomic uh, knock-in, which is really exciting. And then we've looked for, um, we've, we've used puramycin to select cells that have had the cDNA knock-in. So we've gone up to 10 days with the puramycin, and you can see when the repair matrix is used together with talons, after 10 days of selection, there is excellent cell growth, and virtually all the cells are green, whereas with repair template only, the cells are struggling after three days. So we've uh, produced monoclonal populations uh, using dilution cloning and then confirmed using just single round of PCR this time, you, the same primers, that the four colonies that we've isolated have genomic knock-in. And we've looked at the protein level for the GFP in these populations. So this is using fax analysis. And this is cells that have been untreated, so obviously there's no green cells. This is a polyclonal population, so there's still a number of cells that aren't green, whereas the four colonies are showing over 90% GFP expression. So we're quite confident that we have monoclonal populations and we've now made, um, we cryopreserved these cells and um, we'll see if they recover after um, defrosting. So we now need to obviously optimize the repair template. We don't want to knock GFP in, we want to knock microdystrophin in. So we've just achieved this using Gibson cloning. So knocking in the sequence optimized microdystrophin and we've got two variants, one where it's still under the control of the PGK promoter, which was driving the GFP expression, and also under the SPC512 promoter, which is a muscle-specific promoter, because obviously we want to try and restrict expression to the muscle and the cardiac cells. So um, we're now going to test the talons and the <coughs> CRISPR-Cas9s and a variety of cells, so the HEC293Ts, and look for microdystrophin expression. RD muscle cells and the patient muscle cells, but we have just established collaboration with Severio Tedesco at UCL, who on Thursday is going to send us some of his muscle stem cells, which will obviously um, undergo HDR much more readily than the patient myoblast. So we're quite excited about that. And again, we're going to adapt the repair template to use homology independent cDNA knock in. So just to summarise what we've achieved and what's ongoing in the lab, so we've shown that we can repair the dystrophin gene um, using a meganuclease and a repair template. We've been able to show that we can correct the reading frame of the MDX um, mutation um, through mutation of the splice acceptor site, and we can also fully repair the MDX gene using a repair template. And we're developing CRISPRs for universal and near universal gene editing. We have a number of other projects in the lab which um, are fairly new, but with uh, Duchenne, it's not just that there's no uh, dystrophin expressed, there's also the muscle wasting and fibrosis that you need to address, because if you restore the dystrophin in a patient who's you know, the age of 12, it, the dystrophin's not actually gonna work very well because there's no muscle and it's full of scar tissue. So we have a project now using this so-called dead Cas9, which no one's mentioned yet, so I'll have to explain. So this dead Cas9 has been mutated in two positions so that it will no longer cleave the DNA. It will still bind, but it won't cleave. So you can use a guide to uh, guide your dead Cas9 to the region you want to target. Um, and if you tether this dead Cas9 to transcriptional activators and target the right region, you can switch on expression of genes. So for Duchenne, we want to switch on expression of myogenic genes, so those genes that will make more muscle. But we can also want to try and knock down expression of fibrotic genes, so we can use this dead Cas9 alone or tethered to transcriptional inhibitors. So this is work that we're just starting in the lab. We also have a project, so as I said, so many groups have, are targeting DMD as, with gene editing, and they are concentrating on trying to delete exons 45 to 55 which, as I've said, is the mutation hotspot, um, which would treat 65% of patients. But I think if we can go further upstream from intron 44, 
and the other way um, for, from intron 55 and make a bigger deletion, we would make the therapy more applicable. So uh, we have optimized targets to the two introns that we want and the, pro the deletion that would result would um, still be in frame. So there'd be an in-frame transcript which would encode a microdystrophin, which we've seen in dog models is working well. So the, we would then have a therapy that could potentially treat more than 85% of patients. So it's just expanding the applicability. And that's it. So I'd like to thank everyone who's invo been involved in the work and Claudio for the Talons, the AVS1, Vincent Moody for the patient cells, and then all the funders who've made the work possible. And thank you for listening. <laughs>